So the Apostle Paul, um, as you know, if you're familiar with the New Testament at all, uh, is, is a man who understands his position. He is an apostle. Uh, this for reason, or for this reason, he has certain authority. He has a certain ability to uh, tell people a little bit of what, what to do. Uh, he's not overly shy at times. Uh, if you open up the book of Galatians, for example, the book of Galatians, I've always liked the book of Galatians because I like the forthrightness of it. I like the, uh, the in-your-faceness of it at times. And you'll remember that the Apostle Paul, he'll, he'll write these words, Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? You know, um, Man, if I wrote a letter to you, you know, as the church, you know, you know, Mike Young, who has bewitched you? And he said, who do you think you are, buddy? You know, you know, so you get, you know, I get a little bit of pushback. But, but Paul, he is the apostle, and he is the, the founding uh, messenger, if you will, in the Galatian region, and he is, you know, he has some sort of authority. He understands that God has put him in that position. It's not just something that he lackadaisically accepts. Second Corinthians chapter 11, another example here, where Paul, actually much of the whole book of Second Corinthians, but especially in chapter 11, where uh, Paul is, um, in a sense, defending his, his position, not because of the position in and of itself, but it's because that God gave him that position, and so therefore it needs to be respected. That's, that's where it's about. It was not about Paul. It was about the authority which he had from Christ. And so when Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he, he basically says, listen, he says, you know, you're willing to forsake me as the apostle, but you're willing to run after these so-called super apostles left and right. You're, you're willing to abandon the true Christ and follow after other people. And what Paul says is this, you need to stop it. And I, in my apostolic authority, say, knock it off. That's what he does. Well, again, Paul is not overly shy. We see it multiple times. You could probably find other examples where Paul uses his apostolic authority. However, we are in the book of 2 Thessalonians, and so I'm going to ask you to turn there this morning. 2 Thessalonians and as we see this here, we don't see Paul using his apostolic authority, at least not in our passage today. Tomorrow, or not tomorrow, but next week's uh, sermon, we'll look a little bit where Paul is um, focusing in upon a correction. But this week, in our passage this week, what we'll see is that the apostle is seeing the people in Thessalonica, the church of Thessalonica, as partners, as partners in the gospel. He is not talking down to them. He is not correcting them at this, at this point. Rather, what he sees them as, as brothers and sisters in Christ, people working together, part of the team. And so this morning what we'll end up doing is last week we had a lot of material to cover, and I probably went over it too fast. So we're going to back up a little bit. We're going to go back up into 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and we're going to pick it up in verse 13 and come down into the third chapter just a little bit this morning. Uh, I just think that would work out a little bit better. So we'll recapture those verses, and then we'll proceed. Paul has a concern for the Thessalonians. He has a concern for his evangelistic group. And what he sees is he sees his evangelistic group and the Thessalonian church, and he sees them as a team. He sees them as working together. Working together not for Paul's glory, but for the glory of the Lord. So let's come back up then to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, picking it up in verse 13. And I think what we'll do is we'll go through verse 5 this morning. So Paul writes this. But we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved of the Lord, because God has chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and believe in the truth. So as we look at this, we have a, a bit of a translation difficulty, or we have a, a question on the text as we come to these very first words. So let us handle that before we get too concerned with the flow here. We ought always to give thanks to God, to you brothers, beloved of God, because God chose you, and in the ESV it has, as the first fruits. Now, in many of your translations, it's going to say, from the beginning, correct? Okay. Many of the translations, modern translations, King James translations, has from the beginning. So then the question is, so what is it? Is it from the beginning, or is it uh, as first fruits? What's, what's going on here? And so, uh, are those the same words? No, they're not. Okay. So it appears what we have here, let's take the idea of from the beginning to start with, okay? And then we'll, I'll make comment from there. If, we were, if it says, God chose you from the beginning, if we understood it this way, okay, that's not a surprise to us because we see this teaching in other places within the New Testament. So stay here in 2 Thessalonians, but turn also over to Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4, we see that 
Paul describes God as the one who is choosing people, even, if you will, before time begins. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy, blameless, etc. And so we see this in the book of Ephesians. If you go to Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 30, we have the golden chain, which Calvin calls it, and it talks about we are, you know, we are, we are foreordained, we are, we are called, we are elected, we see all of this, we are pre, uh, uh, predestined. And we see all of this, and we understand that much of this happened before we were even born, okay? But is that what Paul, is, it, is that what he's talking about here in 2 Thessalonians? I don't think that's quite it, though, okay? As, as interesting as that may be, and that would be a, it fits with Paul's theology, but it appears that that's not quite what's going on. In the text, the Greek text, there is a confusion, and so there's a preposition and there's a noun, or is there? That's the question. If there's a preposition and a noun, then it's from the beginning. But if it's actually just one word with a slight letter change, then it means first fruits. And so modern day interpreters are questioning what's going on here. I take it that the ESV actually has it correct in this one here. I think it has the idea of first fruits. And so what Paul is saying in this section is this. But we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved of the Lord, because God has chosen you as the first fruits. That is, out of all the people that could have been chosen in Thessalonica, okay, out of the whole group that is out there, God has chosen you people, and he has chosen you to be the first fruits. That is, chronologically, you're the first ones to be saved, but also qualitatively, you're also a great group, which I have taken unto myself. Why is that important? This is important because what Paul wants to do to encourage the church at Thessalonica is this. He says, God has picked you. He has chosen you, and you are part of the very first fruits with the implication that there will be others who will come afterwards. Now, would that not be an encouragement to them? Of course it's an encouragement, because they're not going to stand alone. Others will come. Others will join themselves to the church. And God has picked them, if you will, in a sense, as first fruits. First fruits as the idea from the Old Testament idea of that which is best. Not only is it chronologically the, the first, but also qualitatively. That is, they are quality and they've been brought in. In the Old Testament, you were to give your first fruits, that is the best, to God. So we look at this, and we say, once again, what is the significance of this? Well, Paul sees that this small little church in the town or the city of Thessalonica, a very significant city, they are a, a beachhead, a foothold, if you will, for the gospel right there in that city. Don't give up. I know you're under persecution. I know they dragged you out into the streets. I know they have threatened you. I know they have put a bail on you. Stay with the gospel. You know, if you ever worked in sales, such as I have worked in sales, you know that it's important when you're opening up a new territory that you need to get a foothold. You need to get a beachhead, right? Oh, you do. I remember when I was working for DTI Soccer, I was selling youth soccer equipment all around the country, and the different salesmen were given different states. And I was given, one of the states I was given was Virginia. We had sales in Virginia of zero dollars. Zero dollars. And so here I was, the new guy, and didn't know anything, so that's why they gave it to me. So that means, uh, you know, give him the bad stuff. And by the way, he, uh, uh, you know, who knows? Who, who knows what he can do? And I remember I saw, we had this uh, yellow pages. It was called the Soccer Yellow Pages, and you had all of these different soccer clubs and associations. I wasn't selling to teams or individuals. I was selling to uh, you know, parks and recs divisions, that type of stuff. That's where you're trying to sell. And there was, uh, in Virginia, there's something called McLean Youth Soccer. And I said, well, that's foreordained, is it not? That's a sign, is it not? They spelled McLean wrong, by the way. They spelled it wrong, but that's okay. I said, well, man, I, I have to have this one, okay? So in McLean, Virginia, by the way, if you look it up, it's very wealthy, it's very well to do. And I was able to find the guy who made decisions, that's important when you're a salesman. So I found the guy who can make decisions. And this is a long time ago. I believe his name was Roy Wood. Okay. I mean, that's 25 years ago. That's a big count. And I got a hold of Roy Wood, and he says, Stacy, here's the deal. I don't know you from Adam. You're all the way across the country. He says, but I'll tell you one thing. 
I buy the equipment. And here's the deal. People keep on selling me soccer balls that don't hold air. He says, they will sell me these soccer balls, and guess what? We are a very large organization. And when I get a 1,000 coaches, each of them with three soccer balls, and they're flat, I get phone calls from 500 coaches saying, why did you give us balls that go flat? Because no volunteer soccer coach wants to pump up balls every Saturday morning. Stacy, can you deliver to me a thousand balls that won't go flat? Absolutely. I said, yeah, sure, I can do that. It's a specialized ball. It had their logo on it. We imported them all the way from Pakistan. We got them in. We shipped them out there. I was so excited, you know. Beachhead, foothold. Because here's the deal. If I can get McLean Youth Soccer to take my soccer balls, then I could tell all the other podunk places around there say, well, we're the exclusive provider for McLean. Really? Sure. Order from us. Beachhead. <laughs> my employer ordered soccer balls that don't hold air. He said they're better that way. He says they deflate over the week and therefore they don't stretch the, the strings and so therefore it's better for the ball. It keeps it round. <laughs> Guess how much they did in sales in Virginia after that. It's okay. I just lived on commission. That's okay. When you get subverted by your employer, you don't develop a twitch or anything. You want a beachhead, you want a foothold. And Paul says, listen, 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 listen. Thessalonians, you are a people which God has, has picked. He has chosen you. Out of all the people in Thessalonica, he has picked you. And not only has he picked you, and even though you're suffering, you're, you're still precious to him, hold on. Hold on, my friends, because you are exactly what God wants. He has picked you. Look at the intention of the picking Verse 13, but we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as first fruits. You're the beachhead. You're the foothold. You're, you're, you're the very best, a, a sampling of that which is going to come a little bit later on, because there's going to be more that's going to come. Hallelujah for that. To be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and through the truth. You know, oftentimes, you know, within our circles, we talk about a person and they're saved. Boing, point in time, boom, they're saved. And that is true in one sense. But New Testament theology, what we see here is we see that salvation is seen, uh, yes, as a point in time, but it is also seen as something which happens over the life of a person as well. For example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18, Paul will say, for the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, ongoing progressive perishing, but it is the power of God to those who are ongoing progressively being saved. You see, we, yes, we are at saved point in time, but there's this ongoing sanctification going on there. There's this ongoing work. God doesn't just simply, oh, saved, and then I'm going to leave you alone, but God works with this and grows us and increases us in our sanctification. We ought to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you to be the first fruits, the beachhead, the foothold, to be saved through the sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. You are people who are to hold on to the truth and continue in that. Verse 14, to this he called you through our gospel, meaning the, Paul's gospel, the evangelistic gospel, Christ's gospel, so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, so that in the end you may be saved and saved fully. So then, brothers, that being the case, right? So then, brothers, stand firm, and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. If that's the case, if you're the toehold, if you're the foothold, if you're the beachhead, if that's who you are, if you're the first fruits, if that's all true, if God is, has saved you and is working on you and progressing your sanctification, if all of that is true, so then, brothers, stand firm. Put a stake in the ground, tie a rope to it, hold strong to it, do not move. 
That stake is Christ. Hold on to him. Stand firm. And then it says, hold to the traditions. Now, for us, sometimes that's difficult. So hold to the traditions. What, is, what does he mean, hold to the traditions? I thought tradition was, in a sense, bad. Because that's what we're told in today's world. Tradition's bad, right? Well, oh, that's how they used to do it, but it's not the new way to do it, and so the new way is always better. <laughs> well, let me ask you this question. What traditions do they have? Well, come on, it's a new church, right? I mean, okay. When he talks about tradition, he's not talking about, you know, fiddler on the roof, you know, tradition. That's not what he's talking about, okay? He's not talking about things which you do by rote because you haven't given them any thought. That's not what he's talking about. But he's talking about do or follow the traditions, that is, that which we have taught you when we came, okay? When worse comes to worse, when persecution comes, when push comes to shove, then you need to look back upon that which you have already been taught and say, this is what I was taught and this is what we're moving forward with. Okay? That's what he's talking about here. So he's saying, stand firm and hold to the traditions. Hold to that which you were taught from the very beginning. Don't let people deceive you. You know, I look in the news, you know, uh, throughout this week and we look at the, the disaster which it is in places like Afghanistan. And I look at that, and it's, it's horrific to me. And I see this, and I think it's just such a horrible thing which is happening there. And if this was written to, to people who are in Afghanistan, for example, now may our Lord Jesus Christ, excuse me, <clears throat> so then, brothers, stand firm. I mean, are these, it's, it's easy to say the word stand firm when it's easy. It's easy to say stand firm when there's no pressure against you. It's easy to say stand firm when people aren't going to shoot you in the head or club up your head. Stand firm. And we understand in this situation that they're very much under persecution. They're very much uh, being, being oppressed. And Paul is saying stand firm. Stand firm. And I would have to say that Paul would have very, very little authority or credibility to say that except that Paul has stood firm when he has been beaten and left for dead multiple times. He knows what it's like to stand firm. The Thessalonians, my friend, are the beachhead. They are. They are the toehold. They are the foothold. They are the first fruits. They are the very beginning. A promise, if you will, of a crop which will grow. Paul doesn't say, hey, I'm the apostle, so do this. Instead, what he does, he says, you know what? We're part of a team. And because we're part of a team, this is what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm going to right now pray for you. And in verse 16 and 17 here, we have a, a, a prayer for them. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, Comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. I, I'm struck by this on, on, on uh, the grouping at the very beginning. That, that gets my attention to begin with. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father. You know, that's, that's, that's pretty, you know, there are people who will downplay the deity of Jesus or they'll downplay the importance of Jesus, you know, even within so-called Christianity. But here what we have here is we have a linking with God the Father and Jesus Christ. Do we not? I mean, they're put upon the same authoritative level. Think of it this way. Gentlemen, if you were to go and uh, go to a fancy party, you're all dressed up and you're taking your wife and she's all dressed up and you're introducing your wife to an important dignitary, for example, and you say, oh, now this is my wife and explain who she is. And then you pull out of your back pocket your cell phone and say, and this is our labradoodle. Wouldn't that be weird? Wouldn't your wife be a little bit upset with you? Because you have just put on the same level her and the labradoodle. Wouldn't you? Wouldn't she be upset? I don't see any upset women here. Must be a lot of dog lovers in a weird way here. I don't know. My wife would be furious if I went ahead and said, okay, this is my wife, Elise, and here is a, here's a picture of our dog, our Gretel. Okay? Especially Gretel. 
I mean, Uncle Lise hates Gretel. I mean, sort of, you know. It's a love-hate thing, but, but she'd be horrified. Well, what we have here, you, you, my point is this, is that you wouldn't put two unequals together because it, it, it doesn't work. But here, as we look at this, we see here, now may the Lord Jesus Christ, by the way, he gets first billing, himself and God our Father. Wow. And so what we see here is we see the dignity of the Lord Jesus Christ is, 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 is emphasized here. Now, may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us. Now, this is interesting to us because I kind of expected that the verbs would be plural and move on, but they're not. So it's probably just, it's either Paul is doing this. He's taking them as a group unit, okay, and making the verb singular, or perhaps he's just saying God the Father and then goes on with the singular verb there. I'm not positive, but it's, it's not that important for us today. Now, may the Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. May our Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, and God our Father. And again, we saw the word Father. We saw this earlier in chapter 1 and verse 1 and verse 2. And it talks about the church of, the church of God, which is unusual. Okay? Or, there, or excuse me, well, I should read it. I'm, I'm misspeaking here. Verse 1, to the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's unusual, all right? And so what we have then is saying, may the Lord Jesus Christ, may God our Father, and God who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace. We see here the Father. He is the originator, the protector, the lover of his children, once again, what a strong image which we have here of a father protecting his children. It is the role of a father to protect his children. God, our Father, who loved us. And how does he love us? He loves the church by sending his very own son. He loves the church by giving his own son and then further not only with the payment given, but calling people who are still rebellious by his spirit and saying, come unto me. I'm struck more and more by scripture that it is not sufficient enough for Christ to come and to die and to rise again, but there must be the work of the spirit which must call us unto himself. For God could pay for everything, yet in our rebellion we do not respond, minus the spirit's conviction. Now may our God, excuse me, may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope, he comforts us, he comes alongside of us, not for the short term, but eternally. Gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace. I like the word hope here a lot. You know, I prayed for, for Sandra Hayes' mom at the beginning of this message. And the only reason, folks, that there is comfort is because there's hope. I don't know what people do without it. I don't, I don't understand the atheist mentality. Well, I get it in the short term where they say, well, you know, I'll do what I want to do. I, I, I'm free to do whatever. But folks, we all have an expiration date. We all have a time where we will cease walking upon the face of this earth. We must all face and contemplate those eternal questions. What is after the day that I stop on the face of this earth? And in Jesus Christ, there's hope. And if you don't have that hope, you have my profound sympathy. God gave us his eternal comfort. He has given us his good hope. Through here, grace, nothing which we deserve. You know, these people in Thessalonica, the great majority of them, were lo well, they were lost. They hadn't done anything that God says, well, boy, you really need to get them. But God, by his grace, 
decided to pick them. Therefore, verse 17, comfort your hearts. Comfort your hearts and establish them, strengthen them in what? In good work or good work and word. Listen, we are not uh, comforted. We are not uh, strengthened for the sake of comfort in and of itself. We live in a world today where everybody thinks, well, the highest thing that we can do is to make sure that life is good, that life is comfortable. Wrong. It's an incorrect understanding of the life which you have. God has not saved you. God has not provided for you so that you can just go ahead and live in comfort. God instead has strengthened you, established you, so that you can put your faith into action, and therefore you're involved in both word and work. So let me be overly personal with you. What are you doing for Christ? What is your work? What is your work for Christ? What is your word for Christ? What, 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 how are you talking to people? I must tell you one of the, the more upsetting and difficult things which uh, we have seen with the, the COVID nonsense is our inability to interact with one another, our inability to interact with people around us in our workplace. It was almost considered rude to talk to people. It made it so it was very, very difficult. It, it put evangelistic efforts, oftentimes, put the brakes on them. And what we have to do in many respects is we have to relearn getting out of our comfort zone. We have to relearn talking to people one more time. Now, some of you say, well, I've never had that problem. Well, good for you, okay? And I'm glad that's the case for you. But for so many of us, it was one of those things where you were shut down. Thessalonians, you're the beachhead. You're the, you're the promise of those who are going to grow up after but not only that, I pray for you and I pray that you stand firm because you need to stand firm. I don't want you to be the empty soccer balls. No, no. I want you to be the good example. I want you to stay full. I want you to do what you're supposed to do. That's what I want. And then Paul, as we enter into chapter 3, look at five verses here. What we'll see is that Paul will surprise us. Paul surprises us here because what Paul does is that he treats these people these babes in Christ, these people who have had not that much training, maybe six months when the Apostle Paul was there in Thessalonica, probably at the most, the only thing that we know as far as timing goes is we know that Paul was in the synagogues for three Sabbaths, which technically is, is uh, the minimum would be two weeks, right? Saturday, then another Saturday, then another Saturday. If you got there on a Saturday, it's two weeks. So uh, we, we, we believe that he stayed there a little bit longer before he got chased out of town. Six months at the most? At the most? Babes in Christ. And what does he ask of them? Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored. Paul, what are you asking these babes in Christ to pray for? These guys don't have a seminary education. They don't have a Bible school education. They've barely been Christians for six months. Oh, come on, they're, they're just tiny infant Christians. So why is it important to go ahead and ask them to pray? Because Paul even though he is the apostle, understands that God has a bigger view of things, and God uses the church, and the church is made up of the mature and the immature and all those in between, and that each one of them is important. And these babes in Christ, their prayers are heard by God just as those who are mature in Christ. Pray. They might even pray the wrong words at times. I had the privilege of conducting the funeral service for Jeanette Miller this summer. And Jeanette Miller, I remember when she first came to us, the church, I don't know, five years ago, something like that. And uh, she came, and uh, we were starting a Sunday morning prayer group. Scott Brandon and, and, and John Estes were putting that together, and they were meeting downstairs in one of the Sunday school rooms down there at, at the begin with. Um, I think, Shelly, you might have been part of that group to begin with. I don't remember exactly everybody who was involved. Um, 
But there was Jeanette Miller. She went down there, and Jeanette's like, you know what? I was, <laughs> I was raised Catholic. I don't know how to pray. Do we do it in Latin? <laughs> you know? And, uh, and I remember the guys. I mean, I wasn't there all the time. It was more John and, and Scott just were coaching her, you know? And they just said, pray to God like any other person. Just, just pray to God. Have a conversation with God. Well, that's probably the wrong words to tell Jeanette. <laughs> because Jeanette Miller, if you ever got her on the phone, she would talk to you for an hour and a half. And, <laughs> and when she was in prayer meetings, she'd go for an hour. I mean, it's long. I mean, it's, it's, so, you know. And there she was, a relative babe in Christ. And she was just praying. It was a beautiful thing. It was long, but beautiful. Finally, brothers, you, my, 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 my baby brothers, pray for us. The us here is, is the Apostle Paul, his evangelistic team. Remember, Paul's not there anymore. He's prob- my guess is at this point, he's probably in Corinth at this time. Remember, Paul gets booted out of Thessalonica. He goes to Berea. He gets driven out of there by people from Thessalonica, by the way. And then he goes down to the Athens where he does the Mars Hill thing. And then he scoots over there to, to Corinth. And more than likely, this is written from Corinth. Pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored. Pray that it gallops out from from us and that's honored. You know, when he goes to, remember when he's in Athens, he'll go and he'll give, uh, you know, remember that it's an amazing thing. I love the book of Acts because it gives us such incredible detail and it's so nice to have the history which we can intertwine with the different letters. And you'll remember that in Acts chapter, I think it's 18, when Paul goes to uh, Athens and he He's walking along and he sees an altar to the unknown God. And he says, I know who he is. And let me tell you about him. And Paul begins to tell these people, you know, all of these aristocrats and all of these intellectuals and all these people who, who believe in wisdom. And Paul begins to tell them about Christ. And they listen until he mentions the resurrection. And when he mentions the resurrection, they say, oh, who is this? Who is this little seed picker? Who is he? resurrection. And they dismiss him. And then Paul pops on over to, 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 to Corinth. And even there, things don't go very well, but God says, Paul, but I got so many people in this town. Stay there. I got many people. Pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored. Isn't that an encouraging word to you? You might say, well, I haven't been a Christian for very long, or I've been a Christian for a long time, but guess what? God in his economy, the sovereign God in his economy, the God Almighty in his economy has factored in the prayers of the saints to accomplish what he wants accomplished. And it doesn't make any difference if you've been saved for 40 years or four days. Pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored, not dishonored such as it was in Ephesus, or uh, excuse me, Athens. Did I say Ephesus? Athens, my bad. Speed ahead and be honored as happened among you. Verse 2. And that we may be delivered from wicked men and evil men, for not all have faith. Well, to say the least. That we may be delivered. You know, Paul's been delivered over many times. They've been delivered over many times. And there are many people who are not of faith. However, God is, but the Lord is faithful. The Lord is faithful. At this point, he changed... Uh, well, let's, let's keep it here. But the Lord is faithful, and he will establish you and guard you against the evil one. It's interesting. He goes from the, the idea of a, a prayer for them, or a, a prayer request from them, and then he begins one more time to talk about their situation. God will establish you, that is you Thessalonians, and guard you against the evil one. Well, marvelous words for them to hear, especially in the midst of persecution. And we have confidence in the Lord about you, that you are doing and will do the things that we command. You're going to do what you're supposed to do. We understand that. May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. I like the, the wording here. May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God. 
to the love which God has shown. And the love which God has shown is a love which you are to, to emulate, that you are to copy. May the Lord direct your heart to the steadfastness of Christ, and in the steadfastness of Christ which he had, you are to recognize it, and you also are to have a similar type of steadfastness. In Hebrews, it talks about looking to the author or the finisher of, of the race, keeping your eyes upon Jesus. Listen, it is difficult for us to believe that God is faithful if we judge our lives in the moment by moment. We must not just look at the moment by moment, but we must look to the end. I'm here to tell you that God is there, that Christ is there. Your end will come. Are you looking to him? Are you ready? The Apostle Paul, as he writes the, second, the book of 2 Thessalonians, at least in this section here, is not overly concerned about pulling out his apostolic business card and saying, I'm the apostle, you better listen to me. Okay, It's not what he's doing. He'll have a correction in the, in the sections which follow, that's true. But in this section here, he is treating these people as brothers in Christ, sisters in Christ, fellow workers in Christ, people who he prays for and from whom he asks their prayers towards God. Oh, Lord, we need to work together. The people in Thessalonica are the first fruits. They are the toehold, the foothold. They are the beachhead. They are the ones who are the promise of a crop which will grow into the future. These are the ones whose prayers these are the ones for whom Paul prays, and these are also the ones for, uh, that he asks prayer to come from, that they might ask God to help them. And in all of this, Paul is confident. He's confident that they will do what they're supposed to do. Folks, as we consider this today, let us consider the magnificent power of what God has done in salvation. He has made a team made a team right here we see here you have an apostle and he's leading that team but these people who are the new converts they're not second hand these are people who are important and god uses them all in our world today god can use every single one of us he can use the pastor who preaches he can use he can use every single one of you he has equipped you equipped you and comforted you and encouraged you that you might stand strong and be active in every work and word. So what is your work and what is your word? What are you doing? We live in a strange time. We live in, a, in, a, in, a, in many ways, uh, politically, with diseases and all kinds of other stuff. But help us, my prayer is that God will help us to show great creativity, to be able to reach again into this world and more effectively. Perhaps we are the first fruits in University Place. Perhaps we are the toehold. Okay. Don't say, yippee, buy the t-shirt and call it good. No, no. Say, yippee, buy the t-shirt, that's fine. And get to work. Amen? God is good, he is faithful.